I'm heading out across Britain to find the history embedded in the landscape. This is a country where you're never very far from an ancient routeway, a glimpse of lost industry, or a grand monument from our past. So from coastal paths to hilltop tracks, I've started doing some serious walking. Each of my walks leads me to a different time and a stunning location to find the stories you can only really appreciate on foot. This time I'm in the Scottish borders and Northumberland, walking into the mysterious heart of the Dark Ages. It was a time when the huge kingdom of Northumbria was being torn apart by internal strife and wars with rival kingdoms. But in the middle of all this turmoil, a small group of radical Irish monks managed to persuade the largest kingdom of pagans in the country to put down their swords and become Christians. And the charismatic figure at the heart of that mission wasn't Irish at all. He was a little-known Briton called Cuthbert. The Scottish borders may look rural and peaceful today, but this area has one of the most turbulent histories in the country. And it can't have been easy trying to introduce a new religion to a region of violence and bloodshed. I'm beginning my journey at the medieval abbey of Melrose. My walk may start here, but our story goes back much further in time than the construction of this abbey to the 7th century, when a bunch of Celtic monks with their roots in Ireland came over here to convert the locals to Christianity. And round about the year 650 AD, they were joined by a young man called Cuthbert, who wanted to help in the fight against paganism. And his only weapons were solitary prayer, curing the sick, and feeding the hungry. But that was all he needed to capture the soul of Northumbria. Cuthbert's legacy is still with us today. The cathedral at Durham, arguably the greatest Norman building in the world, was built in memory of him. Over the centuries, dozens of legends have been told about him, about the miracles he performed, and intriguingly, about how years after his death, his fellow monks said they dug up his body and found that it hadn't decayed. For them, that was further proof of his holiness. I'm hoping that over the next 70 miles, I'll discover just how Cuthbert gained his fame and reputation. The four-day walk I've plotted mostly follows a route known today as St Cuthbert's Way. From Melrose, I'll head south to the mysterious Aildon Hills. Then to the little village of Ancrum, where I'll be searching out the pagan roots of this area. From there, I'll walk across the beautiful heights of Northumberland National Park. And finally, down to the coast, to the capital of Old Northumbria at Bamborough Castle, and the spiritual headquarters of the monks on the holy island of Lindisfarne. Cuthbert began his Christian life at Melrose Abbey. But this wasn't the abbey he knew. Sadly, there's nothing left of the 7th century building he lived in. All the same, I want to take a look at the site where it was, which means walking a few miles east. Although nothing at all remains of the first Melrose Abbey, the geography gives you an idea why the monks chose this place. The word Melrose means a bare peninsula. Its seclusion was perfect for an outpost of Christianity set apart from a pagan land and the brutal feuding with rival kingdoms. After the dangers of a day's preaching in the wilds, this must have been a safe place the monks could retreat to, surrounded by the River Tweed. I've arranged to meet archaeologist David Petz, to find out a bit more about Cuthbert and Melrose Abbey. How do we know about Cuthbert? 
Well, we're very lucky because when Anglo-Saxons made their saints, they had biographies written of them. And Cuthbert has his biography written by the best he could get. He had it written by Bede, who's one of the key Anglo-Saxon historians, one of the first Anglo-Saxon historians. And Bede was a monk in Northumberland, so he had lots of good contacts and lots of information about Cuthbert's life. Do we know much about Cuthbert as a young lad? We know he comes from the local area, he comes from the Scottish borders. He's probably of a noble family, um, because when we have a description of him arriving at Melrose to become a monk, after being uh, enthused by having seen a vision, um, as is so common with, with the saints, um, he arrives and he comes on a horse, he comes with a servant, and he comes with a spear. And these are all good, clear indications that yeah, he's somebody, he's, he's an aristocrat. What kind of impression did he make at the Abbey? Well, when he arrives at the Abbey, he sees uh, one of the first people he meets is Boisel, who's the, the prior. And Boisel clearly saw a lot of potential in the young Cuthbert. He was someone who, as an aristocrat, was used to moving in powerful circles, but also someone who was clearly deeply motivated by their own personal belief. <laughs> I've climbed up into the Aildon Hills, just south of Melrose. The Dark Ages is a period veiled in mystery, but it's always fascinated me. And I'm thrilled to have the chance to explore it on the ground. And although St Cuthbert's Way is actually a modern walk created in the 1990s, it does roughly trace the route the monks would have taken from Melrose to their headquarters at Lindisfarne. I was told you could see 20 miles from the top of this hill. I don't think so. Not today, anyway. The task of converting was tough. Most Northumbrians were pagan and had been for a couple of centuries. There'd been Christians in the northeast in Roman times, but the Romans had left over 200 years ago. What followed was a meltdown. The native Britons were overrun by successive waves of pagan invaders, Angles, Saxons and Jutes, who took over most of the country and drove the Christian faith out to the western margins. Northumbria quickly adopted the pagan religion of its new Anglian rulers, which meant the people now worshipped a number of gods, the most popular being Woden. It was a pantheistic faith. They believed the landscape was possessed by spirits, and their sacred places were often hilltops or springs or groves of trees. This was the spiritual world Cuthbert and his fellow monks encountered. But as they traipsed through these hills, the physical world could be just as hostile. Pretty hard going up here in all this rain. Cuthbert would have loved it. It said he believed bodily hardship purifies the soul. No doubt, as a warrior, he'd seen a deal of hardship and brutality. From a warrior Briton, Cuthbert was transformed into a soldier of Christ. We don't know what made him swap his sword for a cross, but it's said that he used to leave Melrose and go out into the wet, wild moorlands for a month at a time, visiting all the little villages and hill forts that the other monks were too scared to go to because they were plague-ridden, and he would take with him a jewelled cross and a portable altar. When they were on their way to Lindisfarne, the monks would follow a mud track like this one. But imagine this on a wet winter's day. The track could disappear. So they had to find another route, and that's when they turned to the rivers. And I'm going off my route to visit one of them. Just taking a shortcut down to the River Tweed. But look at this fantastic house. See that great chunky keep in the middle? Isn't it beautiful? It's called Beamerside, and it's been in the possession of the Hague family for the best part of a 1,000 years. And during the early 1800s, a local boy made good used to come here, the world-famous novelist Walter Scott. He came to admire the views. It's not that we can see anything at all at the moment because of all this flipping fog. At over 100 miles, the River Tweed is one of the longest rivers in Britain. And today, it's an expensive waterway. People spend hundreds of pounds a day for the right to fish on it, sometimes for trout, but especially for salmon. 
And there's a story about Cuthbert and a salmon which I want to test out on Gilly Ian Farr. Nice and incidentally, he's going to teach me how to fish. Thank goodness the mist's lifting at last. What they call up here a fret. Now I can actually see the river. It's really beautiful down here and it's so quiet. But for the monks, this was a practical waterway. Extraordinary to think a thousand years ago and more, you'd have seen them plying their way up and down, transporting timber for building and fuel, and in winter, using it instead of the usual land routes. We look to catch the fish in the middle of the river here, OK, in this white water. So I lift it up. Lift it up. Pull, it pull a bit of a pull, yeah. and then... And then push it out. Do you have boats on the river now? Is it navigable? We have a few boats on the river. We have quite a few canoeists come down. Yeah. I mean, theoretically, if you wanted to shift some timber down here, could you stick it on a boat? Or... Yeah, not, not now. We've got too many, too many weirs in the way yeah. from the old mills. Try and get it to go out here, Tony. Right, so lift, lift up, turn, the lock the shoulder and flick. Perfect. It'd be funny if I actually did get a salmon, wouldn't it? It would be very good. It Likes would be very good indeed. You know the story of Cuthbert and the salmon? No, I haven't heard this one. Oh, it's great. Um, so he's wandering around the uh, countryside. I just dropped the rod a bit. Uh, with a mate of his, a young monk, uh, and they're getting hungry and hungry and they haven't got any food, and the monk starts to whinge a bit, and Cuthbert says, no, it's all right, just, just trust in God and, and you'll get your food. Hang on, I'll do another cast and round and there we go. And suddenly out of nowhere, this eagle comes, whoosh, into the river, picks up a salmon, and he doesn't fly off, he just circles overhead and drops it down at Cuthbert's feet. And so the young monk goes to grab the salmon, and Cuthbert says, No, 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 respect, respect for the eagle, please. Cuts it in half, gives half to the eagle, and they have the other half. Oh, you know, perfect. It's lovely, isn't it? That's certainly true. But do you actually get eagles here? Could that really happen? We don't get eagles on the tweed, but we get ospreys. Well, that's a sea. It's, it's yeah. the same type of thing, yes. And, and would they fly in? Yep, the they'll, take, they'll, take, they'll take fish out of the river, yeah. So it is actually quite plausible. It is quite plausible. We obviously have to take stories about Cuthbert with a pinch of salt. The church in the Dark Ages needed saints. And once they were created and written about, their lives had to include certain things, like miracles. Today, what we'd probably say is that Cuthbert was carrying out humanitarian aid, offering hope to people struggling with plague and war and poverty. I'm climbing up from the river now to find a point on the map called Scott's View. Apparently, it was Walter Scott's favourite place to stand and stare. And when Scott died, his faithful horse stopped here on the way to the funeral, just as he'd done before, day after day. I've still got over 60 miles to go to Lindisfarne, but this landscape keeps me going as it probably did Cuthbert. Just one breathtaking view after another. I'm beginning to get a real sense of St Cuthbert full of energy, very brave, afraid of absolutely nothing. But the piece of the jigsaw that's missing for me is why the monks were in Northumbria in the first place. But that's for tomorrow. Right now, I'm going down the hill to St Boswell's because I've booked into a rather nice-looking little hotel. I'm in the Scottish borders, continuing my 70-mile walk from Melrose Abbey to the coast of Northumberland. I'm just leaving St Boswell's, named after St Boisel. And the next leg of my journey is the big one, taking me a little way east to Maxton, then south to the Church of Ancrum, where I hope to find out more about the old pagan beliefs. From there, I'll head further east along the northern edge of the Cheviots to Kirk Yetholm. Just over 20 miles. Quite a hike. This morning I'm meeting archaeologist Chris Bowles. 
who I hear is constantly drumming up support and money to investigate 7th century Northumbria. And to my surprise, he's an American from Colorado. Chris, are we still on Cuthbert's Way here? We are on Cuthbert's Way. Um, the Cuthbert's Way passes by the church of Maxton, which used to be the church of St. Cuthbert, and it runs through these woods. I know that by the 7th century, Northumbria was in the hands of the Angles, and they were pagans. So why did Irish Christians come here all the way from the Scottish island of Iona? Well, they, they, they come over uh, just shortly after 634 when King Oswald takes over the throne uh, after his brother dies. And it's effectively an Irish Christian takeover of the hearts and minds of Northumbria. Why does King Oswald want Irish Christians? He was in exile uh, on the island of Iona. He grew up effectively on the island of Iona and became a Christian there. So this is the start of a new evangelical wave, people knocking door to door saying, excuse me, do you believe in Jesus? Yes, uh, that, that's, that's, that's a good way to put it. And uh, Oswald, one of the first things he does when he takes the throne is establishes through these Irish monks monasteries from which they could go out and perform missions to the population, convert the population. Oswald was from an Anglian and therefore pagan family. But Christianity offered him a faith focused on one God and one authority. It was an ideal religion for a ruler who wanted to govern a unified kingdom. Since we're on the route the monks took, I'm hoping they left some archaeology behind them. Chris tells me that he was recently looking at an old map from 1860 and found something called a hair well. He thinks hair comes from herg, Old English for holy. Well, here we are. It's well off the beaten track here, isn't it? It is indeed. Ooh. So this is what you wanted me to see? Yeah, this is our, our holy well. Uh, th that's interesting, but I, I can't see a well. All I can see is just like a little trickle of water running through there. Sure, yeah. I, I mean, what, what it is is there's a spring farther back, a yeah. natural spring that, that's coming out of the side of the hill and it's trickling down through this channel. And then somebody at some point has built this dam across it. Oh, this is a dam? <clears throat> this is a stone wall that's going straight down to the bottom. Oh, yeah, I can see it. It's stone underneath, isn't yep, it? Yep, absolutely. And you have a stone basin there. So th this is a serious piece of engineering. It is. What do you think it would have been? It's something to do with baptisms or with healing rituals or something to do with the two churches on either side of us here. Tied in to the cult of St. Cuthbert. This is cult of St. Cuthbert, but we also have another saint in the area, which is St. Boisel, yeah. who was the first abbot of Old Melrose. Boisel could easily have come down here along with Cuthbert. You could imagine that pilgrims are coming up through this route, coming to this spot to pray or to be baptized. This must have been a really powerful, mystical, magical place. Oh, I think so. I just think this is great. I think, I, I think this alone makes the, uh, the whole walk worthwhile. Cuthbert and his brother monks wanted to create a lasting Christian community. But their belief in the virtue of poverty was always going to be a hard sell to poor people who were facing starvation and a life that was usually over by the age of 30. The monks were also up against the very old traditions of paganism, with its array of gods and its reverence for hills, rivers and forests. So how could they make the new faith stick? This wonderful bridge dates from the 15th century. On the far side of the river is Ancrum Churchyard, which I hear is older than it looks and may give me an interesting clue as to how monks like Cuthbert used the pagan past when they went about the job of converting. That story about Cuthbert's fish supper is very charming, very amusing, but I think there's much more to it than that. 
by and large, pagan society was illiterate. They didn't rely on books. They used their eyes and their ears. They listened to stories. They observed the twists and turns of the weather and the seasons. They looked at the behavior of animals. So Cuthbert and his salmon sounds to me like something very pagan. Ancrum Church is a secluded and abandoned ruin today. It hasn't served as the parish church since the 19th century, but I'm wondering why it's here. It's some distance from the village. Is there an older, perhaps pre-Christian explanation? Hey, how are you? If there is, I believe archaeologist Miranda Aldhouse Green will know. OK, so you've got all these brand new Christians. How do they make the decision as to where they should worship? It's important for them to make a connection between the ancient pagan past and the Christian present. So if you look up there, there's this massive Iron Age hill fort. What a statement yeah. about paganism. And the place of worship, Christian worship, is here, and it's no coincidence. You say the place of Christian worship is here. Well, it might have been, I don't know, in the 16th and 17th century or whenever that place was built, but that's a thousand years afterwards. You may scoff, but there is evidence that it goes back much, much earlier than that. If you come over here yeah. and have a look at this, forget all these graveyards here. You're just making it worse for I yourself. I know, I know. These gravestones, they're all know, 18th wait, and 19th wait, wait, century. Don't be patient. What? There. Whatever is that? It's totally different from everything else in the graveyard. Of course it is, of course it is. And it's probably 9th century. It's called a hogback grave. And what it's showing is a persistence of place. So the argument would be if you've got something late medieval and you've got something this old and you've got something way, way back, then this place could well have been uh, a deeply religious place in the time of Cuthbert. Yes, I think so. Just because you change your religion and change your gods, it doesn't mean that places stop being spiritual. That's really what I wanted to ask you. Th this story about Cuthbert and the salmon, am I being stupid in thinking that that might have echoes of the pagan world in it, even though it's a Christian story? I think it does, and one of the things that tells us that, or points us that way, yeah. is that in both early Irish and Welsh mythology, there is a sacred salmon, the salmon of knowledge. Oh. And in the Welsh stories, you have the Salmon of Knowledge and the Eagle of Gwernabwy. And am I right in saying that this is just one example of the way that Christians continually colonise the ideas of the pagan people? Oh, yes, indeed. You've got so many examples. What we call Christmas, which is a very, very pagan festival. Midwinter, you've got a major sun festival to try and bring the sun back and to try and start the year off and fertility and all that again. And, and so if you peel away Christmas and you've got something very pagan indeed. But why didn't they just impose their beliefs lock, stock and barrel? Well, it doesn't work. Work. Beliefs are very, very deeply rooted, so it's difficult to dislodge people from that. So it would have been quite a problem for Cuthbert. Yeah, and you do it by negotiation. You do it almost by stealth. They are introducing the new religion packaged in a way that is acceptable to pagans. And that's what's so clever about it. Well, that makes sense. What Cuthbert and the monks must have done is make Christianity user-friendly. As they went around preaching, they tweaked the message so that it didn't seem too foreign or threatening to pagans. The last few miles of my walk today skirt the northern edge of the Cheviot Hills, where once the monks of medieval Melrose had huge flocks of sheep that brought them a fat income. And by the evening, I should reach my overnight stop at Kirk Yetholm. Tomorrow, I'll be crossing the border into England and visiting a famous Anglo-Saxon royal palace. But right now, there are still a few miles to go before I can call it a day. Day three of my journey. I'm now leaving the Scottish county of Roxburghshire and heading towards England. Once I'm over the border, I plan to visit Yevering, one of the most important Anglo-Saxon sites on St Cuthbert's Way. Later on, I'll be crossing a piece of traditional Northumberland moor, Wheatwood moor. And finally, I'll head up to St Cuthbert's Cave, 
the first landmark I've come across that actually uses his name. This morning, I've quite a hike ahead of me, climbing up into the Cheviot Hills. The monks would have done this climb every time they went south to their holy island of Lindisfarne. And whereas all I've got to contend with are aching thigh muscles and being short of breath, in Cuthbert's time, there were wolves in those hills. One of the high points on St Cuthbert's Way, the views from here extend 20 miles back into Scotland, as far as the Aildon Hills. I think our border country is really underrated. This is magnificent. I'm heading towards Northumberland, the most sparsely populated county in England. This is the border. Doesn't amount to much, does it? Look, welcome to Scotland, welcome to England. That's it. No passport control, nothing. Mind you, in Cuthbert's time, there wasn't even a border. In those days, all the land from Edinburgh right down to York was part of the mighty kingdom of Northumbria. I'm now in College Valley, part of Northumberland's beautiful national park. My next port of call is Yevering, where I'll be digging a little deeper into the Dark Ages to find out about the very first Christian mission to this region. College Valley, incidentally, hasn't got anything to do with education. The name college derives from the Anglo-Saxon col and lech, meaning a stream through marshy ground. Yevering is important in Anglo-Saxon history and also in our story. Behind the curved tram lines you see from the air, there was a palace. In the early 7th century, it was regularly visited by the Anglian King Edwin, who became King of Northumbria in 616. At that time, a generation before Cuthbert was born, it was thriving. I've arranged to meet archaeologist Colm O'Brien, who I hope can make sense of all those sketchy lines you see from above. So what was it that was going on here? First of all, the king and his men come here. As a king, he's got to go round his kingdom and be a visible presence in all parts of his kingdom, because if he's not a visible presence, if he stays over there in Bamburgh all year, somebody else will get the idea that the king isn't doing the job and I can do the job better. So what happened here? They eat and drink here. You've read it in Beowulf. You know what goes on in the king's halls in Beowulf. Yeah. They eat and they get disgustingly drunk. OK, that's what happens. Now, I know that Yevering is one of the preeminent archaeological sites in Britain, but quite frankly, looking round, all Where I can see is a flipping it? field full of grass. Where is it? A field full of yeah. grass, yeah. That's Impress right. me. What have we got here? We've got the big halls, the big buildings, the big timber halls, in which the king receives the visitors and the ambassadors from other kingdoms. So where's that on the ground? About here. Hey. About here. There's a whole succession of them. Big, big uh, timber building. Huge, great, huge, great place. Yevering also plays a crucial part in the Christian story of Northumbria. Before Cuthbert and the Irish monks started their missionary work, there'd been a previous attempt to convert the Northumbrians. But it was a very different kind of Christianity that came to the kingdom in 625, when a monk called Paulinus travelled north from Kent and eventually converted King Edwin. Paulinus belonged to the Roman Church. What happened when Paulinus arrived here at Yevering? Well, Paulinus spent 36 days, B tells us, preaching to people, and then he brings them down here to the River Glen to baptise them. And he makes the River Glen sound a bit like the River Jordan, I think. <laughs> I think that's what Bede had in mind, really. How many people? Thousands. But Paulinus wasn't of the same kind of Christianity as Cuthbert, was no, he? No, Paulinus, he's Italian. He comes to England from Italy, from Pope Gregory. 
So his connections and his background and his Christianity and all of that is Roman Christianity. So did the Roman church's teaching stick here? No, that's all lost because in 633, King Edwin is killed in battle when his kingdom's overrun and what Paulinus built up here was lost. So this area reverted to paganism? This area reverted back, yes, yes. What a fascinating twist in the story. Roman Christianity clearly didn't go down that well here in Northumbria. But by Cuthbert's time, a quarter of a century later, the Irish monks had had more success. Their idea of faith opposed many of the Roman ideas. Instead of a vast hierarchical organisation, Cuthbert's church was small, closer both to the people and to nature. This is a typical Northumberland moor, heather and larks, that kind of thing, big skies, a beautiful, lonely wilderness. I've got this strong sense of Cuthbert being in awe of the natural world. He was especially fond of birds, his companions when he ventured off to preach in the wilderness. As a young man, he'd been free to roam where he liked, but then he became prior of Melrose Abbey, and that drew him into the growing conflict between his church, with its Irish traditions, and the church based in Rome. Someone who feels strongly that the Irish traditions were superior is Cuthbert enthusiast Roy Searle. So what was the difference between the lifestyle of the Irish monks and the lifestyle of the, the Romans? Simplicity, non-hierarchy, community. Uh, they shunned power, and uh, so their, their way of life was, was much simpler, as opposed to, to a, a Roman tradition. From Rome came hierarchy, came, you know, pope and, and priests and bishops. Celtic spirituality was much more egalitarian. There were people who didn't bow down to, as it were, the control and the power that was coming from, from Rome. Why did the Romans get so upset about what the Irish monks were doing? And in one generation, Cuthbert and his contemporaries evangelised a whole people and their impact was spreading right across Europe. And uh, this movement needed to be checked and brought into line. You know, they, they wanted the authority from, from, you know, from Rome, not from Lindisfarne or, or Melrose or elsewhere. The influence of the Pope in Rome was now starting to spread northwards again, and there were new Roman monasteries in the south of Northumbria. The rift between the two factions would play an increasingly significant part in Cuthbert's life, and much of his energy would be spent healing the rifts and finding a way forward. St Cuthbert's Way now heads northeast towards the coast. My walk today culminates at a spot on the map called St Cuthbert's Cave. It's one of the very few points on my journey that's clearly identified with the saint's name. It's a bit good, isn't it? To understand the significance of this cave, I have to jump forward in time to a period long after Cuthbert's death. For the last 20 years of his life, Cuthbert was connected with the holy island of Lindisfarne. It was there that his fame as a preacher and healer grew. And when he died, it turned into an international cult. But then in 793, over a hundred years after Cuthbert's death, tragedy struck the island. Lindisfarne was the first place on British soil to be raided by Viking warriors, who sacked the monastery and killed many of the monks. The brutality of it shocked Europe. The raids went on and on. There was the best part of a hundred years of fear and uncertainty. And eventually the monks decided they'd had enough and they left Lindisfarne and they took Cuthbert with them. And they went all over Northumbria, hiding in the woods. And this is one of the places it's believed they stayed, St Cuthbert's Cave. They have laid the body out and slept right there. This is a moment when I just feel plunged back in time. 
Extraordinary to imagine those monks lying out here at night, Cuthbert's dead body in a coffin just alongside them. Come to think of it, that must have been pretty weird. From the cave, St Cuthbert's Way climbs up to a high ridge, where, according to the map, I should be able to see the rest of my route. So lovely, that, isn't it? That's Bamborough Castle over there. But that is the holy island of Lindisfarne. And that's where I'm heading tomorrow. Well, that brings my third day to an end. And I'm off to find a place to stay in Bamborough. Tomorrow, it's on to the final stage of my walk and trying to find out exactly how Cuthbert faced the biggest split in English Christianity since the end of the Roman Empire. I've reached the coast of Northumberland, so I'm now nearing the end of my St Cuthbert pilgrimage. Bamburgh is dominated by its castle. 150 feet above sea level, it's perched on a shelf of volcanic rock. From the 6th century, this was the capital of Northumbria, home to its kings. Bede called it a royal city, and it was from here that King Oswald brought the Irish monks to Lindisfarne. From Bamburgh, I'll be rejoining St Cuthbert's Way, through Kylo Woods to Fenwick. Then I'm off to the coast again, and the holy island of Lindisfarne itself, where I hope to find out how Cuthbert dealt with the clash between the Roman and Irish churches. Well, it's midday and I'm now in Kylo Woods. Holy Island is still 10 miles away, and the problem I've got is that it's only accessible via a causeway, which is underwater a lot of the time. I need to reach it by mid-afternoon or I'll have to swim across. Machete. When the first monks went out from Lindisfarne to preach and baptise in the wilds of Northumbria, they spoke only Irish, so they were accompanied by officers of the king, sometimes by Oswald himself, who could translate for them. But Cuthbert would have spoken to the Northumbrians in their native tongue, what we know today as Anglo-Saxon. Cuthbert is the hero of this story of the North East because Although the earlier monks were very brave and converted thousands of Northumbrians, Cuthbert had the even trickier task of holding the Christian community together in really challenging times. And the climax of his difficulties occurred just as he entered Lindisfarne. Well, it looks like I've got here just in time. In Cuthbert's day, people crossed to Lindisfarne on foot or on horseback. They used what's called the Pilgrim's Path, marked out today by these wooden posts. Half an hour later, and all this would have been underwater. But right now at low tide, with the sound of seals calling in the distance, there's a wonderfully eerie feel about this place. Yay, I've made it. My very first steps on St Cuthbert's Holy Island. Nowadays, there's no trace here of the 7th century monastery. It was replaced by this medieval priory. So what happened to the Irish church and Cuthbert? Did they ever resolve their conflict with the Roman Christians? The Irish monks were fiercely independent. The two sides couldn't even agree on how to date Easter. I'm hoping historian Michelle Brown can make sense of the chaos. What was the issue that brought the difference between the two factions to a climax? 
the fact that the missionaries from Ireland, from Rome, etc., have been doing things rather differently, and they look different. Like the um, the Roman party had a little bald patch on the top representing the crown of thorns for their tonsia. And the Celts did something a little bit more druidic and punk. They shaved the top of the crown of the head and they had a great mane of hair flowing back. Bede says, for example, they date Easter differently. Why is the date of Easter such a big deal to them? Well, if you can't agree about when you're all celebrating the major feast in, in the focal point of your Christian faith, oh, it's a problem. Yeah, the crucifixion, yeah. The crucifixion. And things like, you know, the king was brought up in the Irish traditions and his queen from Kent was in the Roman tradition, so she couldn't come to the Easter party because she was still in sackcloth and ashes for Lent. But there are bigger issues of how you fit into the international picture. Are you just becoming a local church for local people and a local kingdom at the edge of the known world? Or are you going to actually go European, go international and plug into something much bigger? So they had a big debate about all these issues? Yeah, it comes to a head in 664 and they have a synod at Whitby just down the coast, which is hosted by um, Abbess Hild. A woman? Yeah, yeah. Women had great opportunities in Anglo-Saxon society. So what was the outcome? The outcome was that the king allegedly says, well, much as I respect Columba and the Irish saints, when I get to the pearly gates, it's Peter that's going to be holding the keys and I'm not going to upset him, am I? So it's a decision to go international. So the Roman church wins, and, and that decision that was made at Whitby must have had a huge impact on the guys here who are on the losing side. Absolutely. After Whitby, obviously, there's a lot of ill feeling and some of the Irish and some of the English go to Ireland in a half afterwards. But Cuthbert didn't go, Cuthbert no. stayed. Cuthbert's job was one of reconciliation. He had to try and bring it back together again, heal the rifts and actually try and make it work on the ground. After Whitby, Cuthbert realised that union with the Roman church was the way forward and that was what he advised his fellow monks. But there was still a lot of the Irish radical left in him. He still craved solitude and hardship, the life of a hermit. So it turns out Cuthbert's story doesn't end on Lindisfarne. I've arranged to take a boat out to Inner Farne, the remote and barren island to which the saint eventually retreated to spend his days fasting and praying. Bede tells us that Inner Farne was haunted by devils and that Cuthbert was the first man brave enough to live there alone and fight them. We always think of Cuthbert as being on his own, don't we? But he must have constantly been surrounded by hundreds of these mates. David Steele is the National Trust's head ranger on Inner Farm. For nine months of the year, he and his team live here without mains electricity or most mod cons. What's it like living on the island? Well, it's a very strange existence. We try and be self-sufficient, so we actually start growing our own food out here. So a lot of sort of root vegetables do very well out here. Things like potatoes and carrots and, and onions, which we uh, will grow. Cuthbert uh, liked onions, didn't he? He, he did indeed. And, and, and legend says that he, uh, he when, when they came to see close to his death, he only had three onions in his hand at the time. So, so there was a bit of a link there. And... You got a lot of birds. We've got a lot of birds. We've got about 85,000 pairs of seabirds. That's a lot of birds. In fact, Cuthbert looked after the eider ducks. And locally, they're known as St Cuthbert's ducks or Cuddy ducks. So, uh, so he, was, he was the first of many wardens on the Farn Islands. According to Bede, when Cuthbert first lived here in the 7th century, he had a primitive shelter but no water. So his monks prayed for a well and one appeared in the floor of his new home. David Steele's home is rather more substantial. This is a fabulous building. This was built in the 1500s, and this is a peel tower. Originally a fortified building, it's now home to us. But um, I would like to show you something very special, which we found very recently, just in the bottom here. OK. Down here, yeah. the vaulted cellar, we... Um, we cleared a lot of rubbish out at the back of this, this room, and uh, it's a great room, as you can see, a real big vaulted room. Yeah. And um, found this, and it was basically, we took away some steel bars and, um, and found some steps. It's not a secret room, which is what I originally thought. It's actually a water source. It's actually a spring well. You can hear the water there. A 
Isn't that intriguing? Because you wouldn't build a building over a spring without a reason. So could it be that this building actually respects the footprint of where St Cuthbert lived and had his water source? We'll never be able to prove it, but this is the biggest clue. This is the only spring on the island. All the pointers point to this is where the cell was. Was this the site? Probably was. This is an incredible climax to my journey discovering the very site of St Cuthbert's shelter. Extraordinary to think it's been here and not known about for years and years. St Cuthbert died here on the 20th of March, 687. Bede records that his dying words were a plea to his fellow monks for peace and unity. Live in mutual accord with all other servants of Christ. Cuthbert was a modest man and he shunned the limelight. But the irony is, within 30 years of his death, he'd become a superstar when the cult of St Cuthbert was born. Pilgrims flocked to Lindisfarne and they started leaving the abbey land in their wills. And soon, Lindisfarne Abbey was transformed from being a place of quiet contemplation into one of the largest landowners in Northumbria. Of course, eventually Cuthbert's cult waned as the power of the Catholic Church became global and overshadowed it. And today, we hardly remember him. And yet he was central to one of the most important moments in English history. And I think we should celebrate him more than we do.